I want to start this episode by asking a question. Do you know anyone that's worked with Sir Elton John or Elon Musk, sent people down to see the wreck of the Titanic on the seabed, or closed museums in Florence for a private dinner party and then had Andrea Bocelli serenade them while they eat their pasta? Well, you do now. Our guest today has been called the Real Life Wizard of Oz by Forbes and Entrepreneur Magazine. Steve Sims is the concierge for billionaires, working with such people as Elon Musk and Richard Branson. He's also the best-selling author of Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen. Steve, it's an honor. Welcome to the Run GPG podcast. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you. Um, anyone who knows your story uh, would definitely say you have an interesting life and a fascinating <laughs> profession, right? Uh, you know, a real niche occupation. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, you know, you've been called the real life wizard of Oz. Uh, not a lot of people would qualify for that label, Steve. Um, why do they call you that? Well, not a lot of people would want it because if you think about it, the guy was a fraud. Um, it, was, it was a very funny it was one of those double-edged swords. So I had, a, I had an article written up on me in Forbes, um, and it was pretty, pretty amazing because they did an eight-page article on me with you know, everyone from, as you've said, Elton, Elon, Richard, you know, a whole bunch of powerful people. So it was a great article for my promotion and for my marketing and for my ego. And then they went, he's the real-life Wizard of Oz. And then you go, eh, Hang on a minute. You know, that guy was like some old perf behind a curtain. Is that what people think I am? But I basically became the Make-A-Wish Foundation for people with big checkbooks. And I used to tell people quite openly that I can make you more interesting, you know, via your bank account. Um, and I would take the things that they wanted, the things that interested them, that they liked. And then I wanted to see how far can I push it? Like you brought up the, uh, the uh, Florence, the client literally just asked me for a dining experience in Florence. Mm -hmm. And I learned very, very early on, never, and it's even more important now, never give a client what they ask for, give them what they want, lust, and desire for. And very rarely will they come out and tell you what that is. So that's your job to basically go above and beyond. And that's what I did. You know, the guy wanted a dining experience in Florence. I know he had the checkbook that could cater it. So I took over a museum at the feet of Michelangelo's David, string quartet, piano, top local chef. And then halfway through his meatballs, had Andre Bocelli come in and serenade him. So I took it well above and beyond. And because of that and that creativity and that thought, Forbes deemed me as the real life Wizard of Oz. Well, like I said, there's not a lot of people that would qualify for that label. Um, so let's paint the picture then. Where did it all begin? Like, how did you go from being a bouncer in a Hong Kong nightclub to being a concierge for billionaires? I was pissed off. It's the same as you. Um, you know, we can drop names, we can drop locations, but the originator, the catalyst for all of us doing something is that we get pissed off. We do something and then we go, well, why does it have to be so awkward? Or why does it have to be like this? And as entrepreneurs, we then go and find a way to create it. Bear in mind, Elon Musk invented PayPal because he couldn't understand why it took five days to wire money from one bank account to another. He got pissed off. He invented it. You know. So as entrepreneurs, we always start off by being aggravated with something and then finding a way over it. For me, I had come from an East London family. I was a bricklayer. Now I'm a doorman. And I'm looking at people with with watches worth more than 10 years salary. And I'm like, hang on a minute. Why have you got it and I have not? You know, why are you successful and I am not? So the second I started getting aggravated and internally violent with that question, I thought to myself, I've got to go and ask a billionaire. Now, isn't it amazing how people want to start a business they want to get financial advice. They want to get into real estate. They want to start a line of clothing. And they go to the pub and they ask their mates who have no qualifications on any of those things. So I thought to myself, if I want to be rich, I don't want to go and ask one of my broke-ass biker mates because they don't freaking know. I've got to go and ask a billionaire. So as a doorman, I knew where all the nightclubs were. So I started by getting affluent people into nightclubs. 
And then I started throwing my own parties. And then I started working for companies like Sir Elton John's Oscar Party, Kentucky Derby, New York Fashion Week, the Grammys, the biggest events in the world. And along the way, they would say, hey, you know Elton John. Can you give me a piano lesson? Hey, can you give me a drum lesson with Guns N' Roses? Can you, you know, introduce me to this? Can you get me the front line of this? Can you get me this hand-picked whatever? And I just became the, the, the wish fulfillment. I'm not the guy you really want to hug if you see me and don't know me at 11 o'clock at night walking down the street, you know? Um, so I looked perfectly adequate for a doorman, but I didn't kind of look right for this new concierge industry. So what I was doing was I was using the concierge world as a Trojan horse. I'll look after you here, but I'm going to ask ask you a question over here. Now, in fairness, you're kind of doing that with the podcast. You know, with the podcast, you're getting popularity, you're getting followers, you're getting credibility. But also, let's be blunt, it's your curious nature that is allowing you, via the medium of a podcast, to now interview loads and loads of different people that maybe you never would have been able uh, to chat with in any other kind of life. But now, through the podcast, you can. We didn't have podcasts in the 80s and 90s, so I used the concierge industry to be able to have those uh, conversations. And then the book came out three years ago from what I'd kind of like learned. Um, and then I just took off speaking, coaching, and traveling the world, basically trying to get people to think differently. What was the first experience you facilitated? Ah, very unsexy. Um, because I was getting people into nightclubs, these four guys, good-looking, young, socialite guys, came up the front door and they said to me, hey, are you going to the yacht party? And again, this was in Hong Kong at the time. And I was like, oh, I don't know. I had no idea. I had no, I had no idea what they were even talking about. And I was like, well, oh, there's loads going on tonight. Which one are you talking about? So they gave me all the details of this party and they went inside the lounge. And I walked down because the harbor was actually quite close to this area that I was working in, a place called Wan Chai. I walked down to the harbor and I found the girl that was putting together the party. And I walked up to her and I said, hey, how you doing? My name's Steve Sims. You don't know me, but we got four guests coming down tonight. I just wanted to ask you, do you want them to come at 8.30 tonight or 9.30 to avoid the bottleneck? What would be better for you? Now, the first thing she did, because everyone's got a knee-jerk reaction, most of the knee-jerk reactions is the word no. You know, so first lesson here, fellas and ladies, never ask a question where the answer can be no. So I had said, you know, what time works better for you? She starts going through the flip chart. Now, bear in mind, I didn't even give her the client's names. And I said to her, look, I'm not trying to stress you. I know it's going to be busy tonight. I'm just trying to think of what works better for you. So again, I'm thinking of her. So she turns around, and I can't remember what she said, 8.30 or 9.30, but she gave me a time. And I went, oh, thank you very much. And I said, look, and let's be blunt. Everyone's going to come on this party. They're going to drink, consume, have fun, leave, and forget to say thank you. I want to say thank you now. Now, I was earning $1,000 a week for basically slapping people. That was my job description. Must slap people on the club in the club. That was my job. And I had a thousand bucks a week for that pleasure. So I had gone into my wallet and I had $500. Um, and I pulled out 300 bucks and I gave it to her. And I said, look, tomorrow when this is over, grab yourself a nice bottle of wine and a takeaway and just go, hey, I pulled off a damn good night and chill, relax, and just be thankful you did it. And she was like, oh, I got her thinking of the aftermath, okay? And I gave her the 300 bucks. And then I gambled everything. I went, have a good night, turned away, and went to walk away. Bear in mind, I had not given her the client's names. Hmm. But I'd set it up so well that she went, oh, hang on a minute, Steve. What's the client's names? And when I told her, she wrote them down on the front of the sheet. And as she was doing it, I went, oh, um, did you need them to ask for anyone in particular? And she went, yeah, you get them to ask for me. I'll take care of them. And so I went back to the guys and I went, hey, I've made some calls. I didn't even have a phone. But, you know, I said, oh, I've made some calls and uh, pulled a couple of strings and a few people have got to be looked after. 
But you get in there, you ask for Mandy, you turn up at 9.30, you'll be treated like VIPs for the night. By the way, 500 bucks per person. Now they jumped up and started dishing out this 500 bucks onto the table each, going, oh, thank you. And they didn't even focus on the money. In fact, I think a couple of them overpaid me. And I had to give them a little bit of money back. But they were so thankful that I had arranged it without them standing the humiliation of getting the no, that this was worth paying for. Mm-hmm. And I was like, eh, people aren't paying to get into the event. They're paying to save the humiliation of a no. That, that was it. It's like a prostitute. You don't pay a prostitute to have sex. You, you pay her to go away afterwards. You know, that's an old saying and maybe an inappropriate for the podcast here, but I realized very early on what people were actually paying for. It wasn't the access, it was to avoid the humiliation. And I walked back up to the door and I had just made a ton of cash. I had just cleared $1,700 profit for a half hour conversation. And so it started from there. I started getting more clubs. I started getting throwing my own parties and really just trying to kind of see how big I could take it. But that was what, one of my first big lessons. So Steve, that was a workshop on how to get things done and on networking, actually. You know, if people take the time to actually break that down. So that's, uh, that's impressive. Now, was it at that point that you knew uh, you would become the make-a-wish for people that can afford a company? Or was the growth somewhat organic and fluid back then? Like, when did you know that that was your superpower? When did you know that? Uh, probably eight years later, um, I'm pretty slow to learn. And as my wife says, I'm her favorite blunt instrument. Um, you know, I've been with my wife forever and all I wanted to do was to get off the door. I wanted to get off the door and I wanted someone to go, well, look, you're comfortable. You're confident. Sell my private jets, sell my yachts, become a stock. I wanted a job that paid me you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars a year as as income. I wanted to drive around in a fancy car. I wanted to wear a fancy suit. And I wanted to have a watch that was worth my first house. That's what I wanted. Never kind of got it. Um, Because along the way, I was so focused on building up my Rolodex of millionaires and billionaires. And again, never, ever, ever marketed to poor people. I never marketed to poor people because I knew what it was like to be poor. I knew that people with no money can't afford Or if they can scrape the dollars together to get into a club, I know they're not going to be buying drinks. So I'm not. So I thought, why market to me? I know what I'm like. So I started marketing to millionaires and billionaires. And as this grew, I thought to myself, wow, I'm making good money because I was throwing private parties for around about a thousand to five thousand dollars for a one night party, and I was getting paid. And then I was going to places like Cartier, Mercedes, Rolex, Audemars Piguet, Pictet, Daria Hench, these big luxury brands. Are going, hey, how would you like to mingle with about eighty of the richest people in this area? And they'd be like, oh hell, it great. That'll be thirty thousand dollars, and this party will be brought to you by Mercedes of Kowloon. And they'd be like, all right. So I was getting paid by the people coming in. I was getting sponsor money coming in. I thought to myself, this is ridiculous. You know, I'm walking away with like about 70 grand a night. I thought, this has got to stop. As life was going on, every now and then I would go and have lunch with these people and I'd go and have dinner with these clients that I was building up. I always wanted them to get this, this, monstrosity here. I've always asked for what I want. This was the only time in my life that I was waiting for them to offer me a job. And then about seven or eight years later, I was working with this little car company called Ferrari. And I said to my wife, I said, I've got to get a job. You know, you know, we're we're doing all right, you know, hustling these clubs and these events and getting someone into Marinello and getting someone in the Paris Fashion Week and get you know, I've, I've, I've got to get a job. I will get a job, Claire. I will get a job. And she turned around to me and she said, you've made yours. You know, do you not realize where we're living now? We were living in a penthouse at the time. And she said, you know, we've never had to worry about the rent. You know, we've got a car. I was always on motorcycles, so I always had a motorbike. 
Um, still now, I don't have a car. I just have a garage full of motorcycles. And so as it went on, without me realizing it, and it took her, and I remember she actually printed off our bank statement. And she came in and she put it down. And she went, you have a job. You created it. And I was like, oh. And that was, that was the weird eye opener. It took eight years for my wife to actually introduce me to the fact that we had invented the world's first private concierge firm. Because up until the 80s and 90s, if you said concierge, they thought, what hotel? You know? And there we were as a, as a personal private concierge, also doing a lot of the work for American Express Centurion, the black card, which was the only... So everyone was like, oh, well, if you're going to get a personal concierge, it's either got to be Bluefish or it's got to be Centurion. Well, I hate to break it to you, we were Centurion. So we got you left, right, and center. So it was kind of fun at the time. That's amazing. What a profound uh, moment that would have been. So let me ask you, can you tell us about a couple of the most memorable experiences that you created for clients? Maybe two. Jesus. Well, we've already told you about the Florence experience. Yeah. So we had, a, we had a couple that wanted to get married in the Vatican by the Pope. We had a crew that wanted to go down and see the wreck of the Titanic on the floor bed. I had a client that was a great fan of the rock band Journey. So I got him invited up on stage and he sang five tunes live on stage during a concert. Um, I had clients do walk-on roles on the back of Mission Impossible, The Entourage, a whole bunch of movies and uh, um, TV shows. Uh, I've had people do uh, drums with Guns N' Roses. I've had people do uh, learn to play the guitar with ZZ Top, uh, driven Formula One cars, uh, done unarmed combat with Navy SEALs. If you can dream it and afford it, I was the guy putting it together. Wow. Um, I'm going to ask you about two names. It was mentioned in your bio, Elon Musk. What's he like? Uh, he doesn't waste words. Um, he is very thoughtful. Um, you notice this was with all affluent people. They get to a point where they realize that the only thing they can't afford is time. You can't buy more time. So they become very precious with it. So they do not care what you binge watching on Netflix. They do not care what takeaway you had last night. They care about the impact you're creating. What is your problem? What is your focus? What is your drive? What is your passion? I remember the first time I started hanging around with people like Elon, um, they're almost intense, questionable, I don't know, I'd go as far as to say in some cases, interviews, you know? And it, can, it, it kind of makes you feel like, oh my God, I'm being, I'm being quizzed. Where's the spotlight? I'm going to be waterboarded any minute now. But they want to get into that. I remember at one time I was walking through SpaceX with a couple of clients of mine, and one of my clients was just proud to be walking through SpaceX with Elon Musk. He was just like happy as Larry. The other guy wouldn't shut up, was trying to get Elon to have a conversation, of which Elon's responses were, uh-huh, no, yeah, mm-hmm, that kind of thing. Didn't really want to have the conversation. But this was at the time pre-NASA. And this was at a time when NASA publicly used to humiliate Elon about there's no space in this industry for civilians, you know? And if you remember, NASA were not very polite about Elon Musk getting into the industry. So the, my client, like a, like a d actually brought it up. He said to him, he's like, oh, how do you feel about NASA actually publicly humiliating you? Elon didn't even miss a beat. He turned around and said, they'll always laugh at you seconds before they applaud. And that was the only thing he said. And I was like, whoa, that's good. Luckily, it shut him up. But I have never, ever forgot that. And in fact, that was one of the catalysts that taught me to go, okay, I go for stuff that's pretty outrageous. I need to go for stuff that's laughable. I need to go for stuff that's stupid. So from then on, every time a client gave me something to do, I was like, okay, what is the most ridiculous way that this can go down? What is the most stupid, uh, laughable concept I can come up with? And the funny thing is, and no surprise, most of the time I'd get turned down and then I'd end up with the second or third most ridiculous, which would still be miles away from the original request. But the better I got, it was amazing how many times I actually did get that stupid.
like the way you're thinking, Steve. Uh, one more name I want to ask you about, Richard Branson. I worked for, um, sadly, his mum passed away, but I worked for his mum first uh, doing the Rock the Casbah events when she was raising money for the ladies in Marrakesh. Um, his mum was a fireball. She was strong. Uh, she was a wonderful lady. Um, and yeah, Richard always used to come along to her events. And then I used to work uh, for drumming up entrepreneur events for his neck of Ireland. Um, I used to raise up money for Virgin Unite. And uh, quite simply, I've also negotiated speaking gigs for him uh, around America and Canada. So he's an interesting character. Um, there are doers and there are brands. And Richard's a brand. And if you can think about the difference, Elon's making stuff happen. Richard's branding it. I'll leave it at that, but that's a deeper conversation. Yeah. Well, one I would like to break down at another time, maybe part two, we'll do that. Okay. I want to get into the book here and ask you about some of the concepts and quotes in the book, which is named after your company, right? Blue Fishing. Um, and then I want to talk about some actionable advice for sales professionals and entrepreneurs today. So what was the catalyst behind the book? Like what's it about and what, where did the name Blue Fishing actually come from? So we used to get people to come into nightclubs and we used to give them passwords and it'd be things, it'd be stupid things. Cause I used to like to have to people have people walk through the door with a smile on their face. So I would say, Hey, the password to get into this club, you've got to name two of the Teletubbies or you've got to name big birds mate from Sesame street. And one of the other ones was, um, uh, finish this sentence, one fish, two fish, red fish which was Bluefish. Now, Bluefish, people then started going, oh, is your company called Bluefish? Now, funny enough, at the time, it wasn't. We actually had to do a name change to call it Bluefish. But this is what happened. We went from a silly name on a door to an adjective. People suddenly started contacting me going, hey, I had a birthday party last night. It was pretty decent, but I Bluefished the crap out of it. Or you'd have been proud of me. I went to Beyonce's concert and I was able to bluefish my way back backstage. All of a sudden, it became this, this, this mentality, this status in your head of how to take something above and beyond where you normally would accept. So that's where the whole concept of bluefishing, the art of making things happen, which is the name of the book, came from. And I was contacted one day at a party, and this girl said to me, you know, we were telling stories, and a few days later, she said, you should write a book. And she said, we want you to name all the celebrities and powerful people and what you've done for them. And I said, if I did that, I'd be dead by cocktail hour. So I'm not doing that. And then she said, well, hang on a minute. And she came back a few days later. Uh, she took the no. And then she said, well, hang on a minute. I've just heard a bit more about your backstory. Instead of all the rich and powerful people that you do it for, how does a bricklayer from London start doing this with the Vatican? You know? That's and more interesting. So we wrote the book, giving those tips and tricks and those basic, basic, more impactful items, not expensive, but focusing on the impact. I wrote the book and I thought to myself, no one's going to buy it. You know, no, it's not going to take off. No one's going to believe it. Um, and I don't, did you see the video on the front of the website? Uh, I saw one of them. I don't know which one you're referring to, though. So we mentioned Cole and Sanya Hadda uh, earlier before the conversation. Lovely peeps they are. Um, well, we had to, I was told by my publisher, which was Simon Schuster, you have to do a book launch. And I was like, I don't want to do a book launch. The book's not going to be, you know, not going to, I didn't tell them it's not going to go anywhere. But I was thinking to myself, I'm not going to sit at Barnes & Noble on a Saturday afternoon autographing copies because no one's going to come anywhere near me, you know? So I thought, I'm not going to do that. But they sent me some money and I went down to my favorite whiskey bar and I just signed it over to them. And I said, here you go, kick us out when it's over. And I invited like Jim Quick, Lewis Howes, Sonia Hatter, uh, Cole Hatter, Jesse Elder, Matt Maddox, Greg Reed, a whole bunch of people. And Cole and Sonia Hatter, the devious little buggers that they are, they videoed the whole night. Now, I didn't know this was happening. So on the front page of my website, stevedsims.com, you can actually see this video that they did. And at the beginning of the video, everyone's kind of, oh, it's such a pleasure to be here with Steve. The fact he's done this book, it's wonderful. You know, he's, he's very charismatic. They're all being nice. 
And then slowly everyone's getting pissed and drunk. And the, at the end of it, there's a lot of profanity. And I didn't even know he could write, let alone write a book, you know. And, it, and we put that video up on the website. So we didn't know it was going to take off, but it did. Um, and the reason for me behind it was because I was so furious. Again, it's that aggravation gene. So furious at the way people marketed, branded, sold, manipulated. I wanted to get people to go, well, hang on, I don't need to do any of those things. And I wanted to therefore create more of a life that I want to live in. So I get people to focus on the impact. I get people to stop selling and start solving. You know, I get people to focus on impactful ways of marketing. Like we were talking about hotel stationery. It also happens to be free. So any of these things that move the needle that identify you as different and get people to go, oh, I like the way this guy thinks or this girl thinks, I'm going to do business with them. And to remove the big C of business, which is confusion. Because no one confused ever gave you that credit card. Remove the confusion, seek clarity, and then you'll close. That's fantastic. Um, I've also heard you say that passion is the fuel that makes things happen. Can you explain that briefly? Yeah, there's been many a time, my wife actually pointed this out. I've got so excited about doing something that I've gone in with very little information, with no reason for someone to agree, but I've gone in with such excitement and passion, it's addictive. They say negativity you know, breeds negativity and people that are depressed flock together. When you're happy and you're excited and you're passionate, especially in a world where there's not a lot of it, people want it, you know? And if you can go in there and go, hey, 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 this is going to sound ridiculous, but I've dreamt up this concept and I want you to be part of it. And I want to see how it, and people are like, you, you, you got to tell, tell me what, they're almost begging to be part of that story. And then you've come out and then people have said to you, oh, did you go in there with a business plan? Uh, no. Did you go in there and offer them a big load of money? No, we never spoke about the money. Uh, and they're like, well, how did you get it? Uh, I, I don't know. And that's often been the answer. I've, I've come out of many of the uh, things and just gone, how the hell did I get that? Mm. But I did. Uh, and, and I think it's because I've gone in there with so much passion and excitement. They want a piece of that. We do the same thing, jump and throw the parachute later, you know, come up with an idea, that, crazy as it sounds. And I don't know how we got here, but we did, you know, interesting. Okay. I want to ask you about your filtering process. Like, how do you know when to not work with someone? Yeah. So <laughs> I learned that process because I failed at it. Um, it's like everything. You gain that experience three seconds after you needed it. Um, I've worked with clients and I've made a lot of money from clients. And I've noticed one thing. If a client's a no matter how big the checkbook is, that's still a And the other thing about is they don't get better with age. So I remember in the early life, it was a case of, hey, I'm enjoying talking to you, but um, can you afford me? Can, can you, do you have a checkbook to do that? And I was focusing on your bank account. And when you focus on the bank account, you ignore the relationship. And I noticed that I was getting a lot of clients that was helping my bank account that I didn't like. And I would come home at night and I would be depressed and I would be pissed off because I didn't like this person that I was doing X, Y, Z for. So then I turned around and I said, look, I'm going to change that. It has to change because I'm spending most of my days feeling violent and aggravated and I don't want to do that. So I'm going to chase the person and ignore the checkbook. You know, if I mark it correctly, that should filter. And again, referral markets were always my main. I never had phone numbers or, or emails. So I'm getting referred. And if you're filthy rich, you tend to know other filthy rich people. So as people were coming in, I would suddenly fine tune on you. Why is this important to you? Why do you want to do that? What's going to happen once this happens? And is it going to be sufficient? Are you going to talk about this in 10 years' time? And if so, why? You know, and I would, I would almost become a therapist, but I would focus on the client 
and I started ignoring the checkbook. And I suddenly found that I was now establishing this weird thing called relationships. And it's like someone buying a car and then being stunned. You've got to put fuel in it. You know that the money is going to be a content of the conversation, but it should never lead with it. No one's ever gone into a Ferrari dealership and gone, well, I really like that, but do I have to put gas in it? No one's ever done that, you know, but it's how people work now. They actually chase the checkbook rather than the client and it gets them depressed. So that's how I filtered it. Go for the person that makes me smile and doesn't make me feel violent. Yeah, you also uh, referenced that you, you asked the why questions. And I've heard you say that sometimes why is an offensive word to people. Can you explain that? <laughs> yeah, so people will DM me and they'll be like, Steve, I'm in Los Angeles. Let's get together for a beer. And I'll DM them and I'll go, why? And none of it. And I'll get people to respond, well, I heard you were a nice guy, but you, you're a prick. I don't want to do And they'll go off on it, you know? And then I'll get other people going, good question. Actually, I'm working on a project and I would like you to be involved in it or I need your help. Or I want to talk to you about coaching me. And I'll be like, fair enough. Great. When should we meet? I want to save myself the time by understanding what's the point. Okay. And it is funny how that three letter word can really get people. People come up to you and they go, hey, I want to do this. And you'll go, oh, that sounds fantastic. Why? And they'll be like, uh, You've really got to get to the why in order to be able to charge the invoice. Interesting thought. Okay, now um, I've heard you say as well that communication is a dying skill set, and I agree with you wholeheartedly. Uh, why do you think that, and why is good communication vital to making things happen? Well, it's air, and sadly, it's it's freaking going. It's like you've got a flat tire. We need to get that repaired quickly. Um, we're in a world now which increasingly has become transactional. Like it'll be nothing for you to walk into the house and go, hey, Alexa, turn the music on. Hey, Alexa, turn the heating on. Hey, Siri, phone mum. You know, it's, we're, we're coming very transactional. You know, you go on Amazon and you just go, don't. we don't have relationships. We now create transactions. And it's distancing ourselves, okay? If you think you have a relationship with Amazon, Phone them up tomorrow and go, hey, I'm thinking of changing my toilet roll. Which one would you recommend? There's no number that you can call. There's no conversation. They don't help you. They transact to command. And we're getting used to it. Marry that with the fact that we're becoming more educated or it's becoming more revealed how unadvanced we are, whether it be Black Lives Matter, me too, even COVID, uh, politics, all of these subjects are out there which are scaring us into making a conversation. People are literally scared to walk up to a girl at work now and go, hey, you look fantastic today, for fear that she will turn around and say, hey, I didn't dress for you, I dressed for me. Keep your comments to yourself. And then it's kind of like, I was only trying to be nice. No, you're not. You're trying to be sexy. I actually held open a door uh, a while back for a girl to come through to get coffee. And as she walked through, she turned around and she said, thank you, but I can open my own door. And I said to her, I didn't do it for you. I did it for me. And, and that was my response. But now, if I, had, if I wasn't doing that for me and my son was with me, and I said to him, son, I don't care which way the world goes. But when someone's in front of you that's older than you and you're sitting in a chair, you get your ass off that chair and you give them that chair. If someone's trying to go through a door and they've got something in their hands, male or female, you open up the door. If a lady's going through the door, you open the door. That's called chivalry and courtesy. And I had to, I had to say that to him because this stupid <laughs> was potentially affecting the future of gentlemen being gentlemen. Yeah. And we are scared to have conversations now. You're scared to say something in case someone says, oh, that, that, was, that was slightly you know, racist, Steve, or, or that came out in this way. And the worst thing is sound bites. I guarantee you, you could take this interview, find a sound bite in there, glue it together, and you wouldn't have to try too hard that makes me sound like an arsehole. 
okay? But you know the funny thing is, I don't care, okay? Because I'm gonna have those conversations. And if I say something out of turn, I wanna know I said it out of turn so I can make sure I never repeat that again. But instead of having those conversations that we need to have today, we're doing the alternative by not having a conversation. If I've offended you, I want to know why I offended you. Please bring it to my attention. Help me know what I did wrong, okay? Don't get on your bandwagon. Don't go on a freaking march, because most of the people doing those don't even know what the freaking marches are, are for. Educate us, be better people. And I think people are scared of having conversations now in a time period where we actually need to be having more conversations. What an interesting breakdown, Steve. Okay, here's a deep one. You're speaking to entrepreneurs, sales professionals here. That's most of our listeners and subscribers. What's the right way to connect with powerful, influential people and open doors? Dead simple. Be a solution, not a sale. You want, you want to do a little bit of homework on who you're dealing with. Now, I don't care if you're going after a, a, you know, a mother or father of two that lives just down the road with you, or you're trying to go after Richard Branson and Elon Musk. Do your homework and discover what are they working on that you can provide a solution to. And then you go forward and you go, hey, and two things. The first thing you do, and if you rewind this video, uh, this uh, podcast, you'll actually hear I did it earlier. Whenever you walk up to anyone that doesn't know you, and you probably had this, David. How many times, David, have you had, because of the success of this podcast, how many times have people listened to you so much that they think they know you, and then they meet you and they go, David, how are you doing? And they feel as though they've got to know you, and you're stood there going, who the f*** is this? I don't know this person. And you don't want to be offensive, so this is all happening on the inside of your head, and you're going, do I know this person? Is he a friend of a friend? Have I interviewed him? Has he been on the podcast? Oh, my God. And you're getting very tense. And the person in front of you is looking at you going, well, why isn't he being nice to me? You know, why isn't he conversing? And they walk off going, well, he was arrogant and stubborn. You know, the easiest way to get rid of that is to walk up to someone and go, hey, David, how you doing? My name's Steve Sims. You don't know me. That's the first thing you say. It relaxes people and they can go, whew, okay. Now the next question is, well, what does he want? So then you turn around and go, hey, I know you're working on a new project. Or I, know you, I know you're having a new garage built on the side of the house. Have you looked at what kind of roofing you're going on there? I'm a roofer. And I just wondered, have you considered what roof you're putting on that garage? Now you're coming along with a solution. You see, today, with COVID, with politics, with all of the, I've already told you, because of the, the, the distraction and distortion that we've got today, we don't want to slick our salesman selling us something, okay? But we want a solution every single day of our life. If I, do you have a mortgage, David? No. All right. So um, I was going to go there with a the mortgage, so okay, I won't. Yes, I do, Steve. Yes. Yeah, have a mortgage. Great. All right, so let's, let's, say from, let's say from saying it's credit card, let's say from saying it's a car payment, you know, whatever you've got, any liability you've got. If I woke you up at one o'clock in the morning and you stumbled down to your door and the first thing you were surprised, how the hell does he know where I live? But then the second time, you're going to think, the second thing you're going to think is, what do you want? It's 1.30 in the morning. You're not happy with me. But if I said to you, David, I'm sorry for bothering you, but I just found a way that I can actually reduce all of your credit card debt. I found a way that I can pay off your car. I found a way that I can reduce your mortgage by half. It's 1.30 in the morning. You've just been dragged out of bed. But I now have your interest because I've turned up with a solution. I'm a great believer that whenever you turn up to someone, 
you do you do a solution. So, David, I'm going to play a little game with you. Oh, no. All right? Okay. I'm having a dinner party next Saturday night, and you're in my area. And I say, David, you've got to come to my dinner party. And you go, hell yeah, Steve, I'm coming. What's the first question you ask? What time and what do I bring? All right. Why don't people do that when they're getting into a relationship when they go to a relationship it's like hey i've got this product i want to sell you i've got this hey can you endorse me can you do this for me can you introduce everything's me 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 you've just turned around you're coming to my party and the question you asked was the only question that matters what can i bring so whenever you walk up to a relationship especially a relationship you don't know ask yourself what can i bring to the party it's a simple thought, but people don't think like that. So I passed. Yeah, I passed. <laughs> You'll be amazed at how many people get it wrong, but you passed. Ah, thanks, Steve. Um, okay, I've heard you talk about fear. How do you use fear to drive you, and what advice would you give a sales professional or entrepreneur to overcome fear? Very easy answer to that. So I've always been frightened of being the same person that I am today in six months. Now, my life's pretty nice, but I want to have grown. I want to have experienced. I wanted to have failed. I wanted to have tried different things within those six months. Otherwise, I become stagnant and die. But I've always been propelled to want to try something in order to know if I like it or not. But it was Joe Polish that put it in words better than me because he's quite an, art an articulate little um, he actually turned around and he said, the definition of hell is to meet the man or woman you could have been. And I was like, oh, my God, I, I don't ever want that. I've always envis envisaged in my life that I die. And thanks to my wife doing so much good work, I still get let upstairs. And I turn up at the pearly gates and St. Peter's there. And he hands me an old fashioned and says, well, you had some fun, didn't you? That's what I want. That's, that's how I want the end of my life to be. I love it. Okay. Um, what do you do to pull yourself out of your comfort zone? The Steve Sims comfort zone. I do a lot. So I've done uh, MMA. I've done kickboxing. I currently, I race motorcycles. Um, in fact, last week you mentioned it. I went, um, went to Maui. Okay. Never been scuba diving in my life. So uh, Brandon hooked me up to go um, scuba diving, okay? Scared the living shit out of me. I've never done it before, and I never want to do it again. But I tried something that I'd never done before because I wanted to be educated enough to go, yeah, that's not for me. So I'm constantly trying different things, and you can do it as well. Here's a common thing. When you go out for a meal, and you get the appetizers before you order the entree, order an, an appetizer that you've never had before. Teach your body to try new things. That's real fun when you go to a sushi restaurant and you can't even pronounce the stuff and you suddenly end up with like sheep's bollocks or something. But hey, you never would have known if you hadn't taken a chance. So I'm constantly trying different things just to stretch me out of my comfort zone. At the moment, I'm learning Italian, and I'm sure I'm going to get my head kicked in when I go to Italy and try to use that Italian, but I'm trying it to stretch myself. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, I want to ask you about uh, one more quote from the book here. Opportunity comes when you're in the right place to accept it. So has anyone ever kind of bought a car or a watch and you've seen it, and then you said the words like, oh, I've never seen that color on a car before, or I've never seen that watch before. And then the following day, that's the only color you can see on the road on cars. You know, someone buys a white car, and then the following day, it's like, bloody hell, there's a lot of white cars. As an entrepreneur, we've got to get our eyes open to opportunity in order to be able to see the opportunity. So that's the main focus. And I believe by stretching yourself out of your comfort zone, you're now opening your mind to change. A lot of people don't like change. The successful people over COVID were those ones that COVID hit and they went, all right, how can I make this work for me and not 
to me. There were a lot of people that went, oh, woe is me. Reach for the remote control. What am I going to binge watch on Netflix? Okay. And then there's other people that went, well, look, I don't know how long this is going to last, but let me rework my sales brochure. Let me work on my copywriting. Let me focus on my social platforms. Let me work this for me. And that's what you've got to do. You've got to be open to change in order to be able to see the opportunities that are already there. Great suggestion. And uh, final question on this topic. For sales professionals, entrepreneurs that want to make things happen and achieve great things in 2021 and beyond, what's one thing for them to focus on? Well, apart from joining simsdistillery.com, which is my online inner circle, shallow plug, well done. Um, I would focus on the solution. Uh, a lot of people, and I would tell them to go back to that sales material and look at it as though you hate it and go, how selly is this? And you don't want it to be selly, you want it to be solved. If The beautiful thing is there's two ways of marketing in the world, only two. One is aspirational, you know, buy this watch, buy this car, get this handbag to demonstrate you've made it. You know, it's like the people that can't afford much but they buy an Armani tie or they buy a, a Gucci belt just to show off to you, okay? Those are status symbol purchases. That's aspirational marketing. Your headache tablet has none of that. Your headache tablet doesn't have a pretty logo. It doesn't have a pretty box. It doesn't give a shit about that. You care that it works. When you are solution-based marketing, all the branding and prettiness falls by the wayside. So focus on your copy to see how much of a solution are you versus how much of a sell. Okay. Um, and here's a question. You know, we've been talking about this. You make things happen for uh, clients and uh, friends and associates, you know, networking. What's on the Steve Sims bucket list? Like what's an experience <laughs> you'd like to have before all is said and done? Well, I live so vicariously through my clients. And now I do a lot of speaking all over the world and I do a lot of coaching I have moved away from spending billionaires' monies to give them interesting cocktail stories to coach and work with entrepreneurs to help them have their own stories. And I will be happy when I'm on my deathbed when I know I've helped enough entrepreneurs do and think differently. And I openly say, if a bricklayer from London can be doing this, you're already out of excuses. <laughs> Great. Now, I wasn't going to ask this question. We ask it on podcasts from time to time, but I'd, I'm dying to know your answer. You could have dinner with any three people in history, past or present, who would they be and why? And it's interesting what you get, Steve, sometimes. So who would be at the uh, Steve Sims dinner table? Anybody, past or present? Right. So I, I've, I've actually been asked that question before. Okay. So I know, I know the two. So I think I know the three. So in no order, Jesus, okay, what kept you so focused when everyone else was against you, okay? Margaret Thatcher, one of the most powerful political leaders, um, again, at a time where women were not supposed to be powerful, it was like uh, against all, all gold, and there she was, the Iron Lady, and the third one, which is always my first answer, which does startle a lot of people, Hitler. Okay? I want to know why a short, brown-eyed, brown-haired guy from Austria was building up a race of tall, blue-eyed, blonde people that was completely opposite to him. He was building a nationality and a culture they would eventually turn around and go, well, hang on, you're not part of the game. We'll kill you. I want to know what he was so scared of and why he was doing that. So there you go. So those are my three. I think it would be an interesting... And the fourth one would obviously have to be a really good mixologist that could keep us with the alcohol going during that dinner. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Jesus, number one answer we get, actually. First time we've had Maggie Thatcher. First time. And second time we've had Hitler. Very interesting. There you go. Um, there you, there go. you go. Yeah, so for some of the same reasons. But Steve, what an awesome discussion. I really enjoyed that. There's so much we can take away from that discussion. I think it's clear that we'll always remember the experiences more than the price tags. Thanks again for that. Oh, yeah. Now, listen, Steve, uh, where do you want people to find you, follow you, uh, go uh, look up information? Where do you want them to go? 
Oh, it's easy. I've got a Facebook page called An Entrepreneur's Advantage with Steve Sims. That's free of charge. Okay. Um, and then I've got Sims Distillery, which is my personal inner circle where I do coaching and you know talk about it. But basically, you can either go to An Entrepreneur's Advantage with Steve Sims or you can go to stevedsims.com to find out about my podcast, find out about my speakeasy events, my coaching, everything. It's all there on that hub. And the, uh, wh- where do you want people to buy the book or is that what you want them to do? They can go to stevedsims.com or they can just quit. They can go onto Amazon, just look up Blue Fishing, The Art of Making Things Happen. And if you love it, tell your friends. If you hate it, tell me. Absolutely. Thanks a million, Steve. See you later. Bye.